As we speak, Hurricane Maria has just departed Puerto Rico, which has hardly recovered from Hurricane Irma, which wreaked havoc across Florida and the Caribbean a week after Hurricane Harvey flooded Texas and parts of Louisiana. Meanwhile, Mexico has been hit with devastating earthquakes twice, killing hundreds. We are living in an era of extraordinary disasters, of increasing frequency and power like we've never seen before. Shutting down hospitals and schools, cutting millions off from electricity and potable water, destroying houses and homes, impeding access to health care and services, driving many of all their most prized possessions, leaving others with no home to return to and no insurance to rebuild. Injuries and loss of life are catastrophic. Cost of reconstruction incalculable. The most vulnerable and needy in society suffer the most. It's an expression we use to describe a natural disaster. We call it an act of God. However, it's difficult for us to reconcile a God we like to believe is merciful and compassionate with the innocent suffering that we see in the reality of our lives. In times like these, we ask the age-old question, why do bad things happen to good people? The Bible has a great deal to say about natural disasters and the purposes that they serve. We all know the story of Noah. Forty days and forty nights of flooding, because according to Genesis 6.11, The earth became corrupt to God, and the land was filled with something called Hamas, something completely unrelated to the terrorist organization running the Gaza Strip. In Hebrew, that word Hamas is um, associated with violence, chaos, and lawlessness. In contrast, Noah is said to be righteous and wholehearted, unlike the rest of his generation. So many questions. Are all the people truly wicked? The children? The elderly? The infirm? And even if we take for granted the wickedness of the people, do all the animals really need to suffer? And if Noah is such a righteous man, why does he not argue with God, as Abraham later will do over the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah? It's not a story that teaches us about history. It teaches us about morals. But then we have to ask, what morality is there in the annihilation of people and animals? We may be asking the wrong question. What happens following the flood? God enters into a covenant with Noah on behalf of all humankind. God promises never to destroy the planet again, provided that we be fruitful and multiply and do not take the life of any other human being because, as we are reminded in the Torah, all human beings are created in God's image. The moral lesson of Noah is the fact that our task is to replace Hamas, violence, chaos, lawlessness, with justice and righteousness. If we follow a certain moral code, which recognizes the value of life in all human beings, then we will have done our part to secure the future of humanity and the plants and animals that make up our environment. The story of Jonah involves a different kind of a storm, albeit on a smaller scale, but again, there is a similar moral lesson to be learned. As you will be reminded when we read from Jonah, on Yom Kippur, God sends Jonah on a mission to tell the people of Nineveh to repent. Jonah tries to get out of it by hopping on the next boat to Tarshish, but suddenly a great wind and a mighty tempest threaten to destroy the boat and everyone on it. As we know, Jonah agrees to be cast overboard where he is swallowed by a giant fish. The point of the story, of course, is not the fact that Jonah lives to tell a whale of a tail. I couldn't resist. <laughs> The point of the story is that lives are at stake both on the boat and also throughout the city of Nineveh. God cares about those lives despite the wicked choices that those people may have made. God wants them to have an opportunity to redeem themselves. And unless Jonah assumes the responsibility for these people, they surely will perish. 
Again, the purpose of the storm is not the actual destruction in and of itself. The purpose of the storm is to motivate righteous and ethical behavior. In this case, Jonas and those with whom he would impart this critical message. Again, in the story of Elijah, we have yet another natural disaster with the purpose. Let me set the scene, and I'll just prepare you. It's a little bit like Game of Thrones. Uh, the Jewish people are divided. There's a northern kingdom. There's a southern kingdom. Ahab is king in the north, uh, but he's fallen under the influence of the wicked Jezebel who seduces him to abandon our God for false gods. Uh, Jezebel persuades Ahab to make her pagan gods the national religion of Israel, and she slaughters a number of the Hebrew prophets. Elijah, in turn, leads a revolt in which Jezebel's false prophets are massacred. But then he's forced to flee for his life, and he takes shelter in a cave, at which point the word of God instructs Elijah to climb a mountain. First book of Kings 19, 11 and following, And behold, Adonai passed by. There was a great and mighty wind, splitting mountains and shattering rocks by the power of God, but God was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire, but God was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And what does that still, small voice say? It asks, why are you here, Elijah? We all get the moral of this story. God was not in the wind, the earthquake, or even the fire, just as God was not in Noah's flood or Jonah's storm, just as God was not in Hurricane Harvey, Irma, Maria, or Jose, just as God was not in either of the earthquakes to hit Mexico. We call it an act of God, but that's not God. God is the still, small voice that asks us, why are you here? And this is not a philosophical, I think, therefore I am kind of an inquiry. This is a moral question. What are we doing here? The storms are going to come and go, but what are we doing about it? What are we doing to protect the most vulnerable people in our society? The still small voice is the voice of morality, telling us that we have a responsibility to step outside the cave that we've been hiding in and to go back to the people to do what we can to help them. The Kabbalists describe the very creation of the world in terms of natural disaster. According to Luriana Kabbalah, God was originally manifest in the universe by means of ten spherot. These ten spheres represent the crown of God, understanding, wisdom, judgment, mercy, beauty, majesty, eternity, the foundation, as well as God's feminine presence. A little gender fluidity there. In the worldview of Isaac Luria, an omnipresent God meant that there wasn't any room in the universe for the creation of the world. Therefore, in order to bring about the creation of the universe out of nothing, part of God's presence had to retract through an act called tzimtzum, creating a vacuum which was immediately filled with beams of divine light. But then there was a cosmic accident of cataclysmic proportions. The light emanating from God was too much for the spherot to contain. Seven of the ten vessels exploded in the Shvirat HaKelim, a big bang of sorts in which shards of the shattered vessels shot across the universe. Enough of the light returned to its source for the essence of God to endure for eternity. But the remainder of that light, like the Jewish people, is scattered about the world in the form of exile. Consequently, the world we live in was rendered imperfect because nothing was in its proper place. God's task was to begin the process of mending the world, but the completion of that task was left to humanity, was left to us. We do our part of tikkun olam, restoring the world, when we bring the light of Torah into the world. We do this by applying to our lives the morals, the values, and the ethics that we find in the Torah. 
As always, natural disasters galvanize a commitment to justice and righteousness, as we saw in Noah, Jonah, Elijah, and Isaac Luria. With the advent of the extreme weather that we're seeing in modern times, we no longer have the luxury to hide out in a cave of ignorance. Just as Jonah didn't have the privilege to forget about what he had been told, neither do we have the privilege to disregard the science on climate change and the things that human beings are doing today to exacerbate extreme weather and its consequences. There are those who are more concerned about business revenue than they are about the cost of pollution to society and the world. But do they really think that monster hurricanes are better for business? Think of all the jobs that are lost. Think of all the homes destroyed without insurance to rebuild them. Think of all the people to provide for. The Torah commands us to provide for the widow, the orphan, the needy, the stranger. But with every act we do to pollute the environment, we play a role in the global warming that is ruining the lives of the most vulnerable among us. Complaining about bad things happening to good people is the easy way out. Bad things happen to good people because we're not doing our part to protect those good people. And there's a great deal that we can be doing right now. I'm not talking about hugging trees and conserving our napkins as we do in the Rosenberg family. It's, it's all well and good, it helps a little bit. But what I'm talking about is signing back on to the Paris Climate Accord along with almost every other country in the world. I'm talking about mandatory constraints on industries deforesting the land and or polluting the atmosphere. I'm talking about investing in wetlands and other natural phenomena that prevent flood damage. I'm talking about quitting our addiction to fossil fuels. I'm talking about mandates to produce more fuel efficient and economically efficient electric cars, trucks, and trains. I'm talking about replacing every light bulb in NYC with an, LY, with an LED. God is not in the natural disasters. The spark of God is in each and every one of us. When we do our part to diminish our contribution to extreme weather in order to protect everyone and everything in our environment. We say Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of creation, the birthday of the world. This year, let us honor this world through the work that we do to protect and to preserve it. Let this year become a Shana Tova because we have made it so. Shana Tova. Thank you.